Welcome everybody okay, to 52 Living Ideas. We are beginning a series on flow by Chiksent Mihaili. Mihaili, Chiksent Mihaili. Maritza taught me how to pronounce the name. So I think it's right, but I'm not sure. Um, so uh, what we're going to do today is today's introduction. Um, this series is being led by Joya, Ash, and Maritza, each of whom is capable of doing this all on their own. And it's three times the power that we have. But more importantly, this is going to be extremely interactive. It's relatively simple concept, but all relatively simple and good concepts have tremendous amount of, um, you know, kind of expansion in all kinds of dimensions. And that's what we're going to explore. And we're going to explore it together. So it's going to be highly interactive. So the format is going to be, everybody talks about what they're, first we are going to talk about what have we learned about the flow so far? What, what, what impressed us about this concept? Um, in the initial stage, I invite people who have read the book who are familiar with the book or have watched the video to comment on that. So that's session number one. Step number two, we are going to go to breakout rooms. Um, this time, probably only once, but in the future, uh, we are going to do it multiple times. Um, and then we're going to come back with our questions, the biggest questions that we have. And then we are going to do a lightning round of answers to those questions. So it's going to be an extremely interactive format. We're going to start with Ash, then I'm going to call on anybody who has read the book to, um, to contribute. Now go ahead and tell us how familiar are you with the concept of flow? If you are very familiar, it is going to be four. If you're not familiar at all, it's going to be one. Okay, so one is poor familiarity. Uh, two is okay. Three is good. And four is excellent. So go ahead and type in where you are on the knowledge of flow. Thank you, folks. All right, um, so we're gonna get started with uh, Ash. Um, and Ash is going first because he is in Galapagos Islands right now, and his internet connection is always iffy. So go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm just on the street here in uh, Puerto Vaquerizo Moreno uh, on San Cristobal Island, and there is very little uh, Wi-Fi access here. So I think I found a spot that will hopefully hold up for a bit here. Uh, but I'm just between the street and the waterfront, so there may be a bit of background noise. If you see, if you hear some rude noises, that's probably the sea lions back there. Uh, <laughs> they're everywhere. Um, but yeah, so I'll probably get back a little bit more to my trip here because that's related to why we started this podcast or this uh, this series. But um, I guess to begin with, we, we all kind of wanted to talk about just how we uh, came to be introduced to this concept of flow and uh, get interested in this uh, study of flow psychology. Um, and so for me, um, I... When I started college, I was originally planning on studying psychology, but I switched my major to philosophy. And then right after uh, I graduated, my health collapsed and I spent the next decade or so dealing with chronic health issues. Um, and as uh, after I got diagnosed and started getting treated, as I started recovering some of my cognitive function, um, a couple of things happened. One, I started having these experiences uh, that I later would uh, identify as flow states um, that I really hadn't been having in many years because just my whole cognitive and physiological function was at such a depressed level. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I started reading more about psychology and in particular about this uh, school of psychology that had recently been emerging called positive psychology. And uh, it was founded um, by a couple of psychologists, one Martin Seligman and the other is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And so this book uh, that he published in the 90s on flow is uh, kind of one of the first couple of major uh, pieces of work to come out of that school of positive psychology. And the, the point of positive psychology was to um, try to look at psychology from the approach of not just identifying 
uh, psychological, um, you know, defects like neuroses, psychoses, and trying to figure out how to ameliorate them or treat them. But to actually look at the conditions for uh, healthy psychology to be able to promote uh, psychological well-being and flourishing. Um, and so that really resonated with me. And uh, are, are you guys getting a lot of background noise I see in the chat? Can you guys hear me still? Uh, we can hear you. Uh, so folks, uh, he, uh, Ash is on the Galapagos Island. Sorry, bear with me. <laughs> with, a lot of, with, with a lot of background noise, uh, he, has to, he had to struggle to find a Wi-Fi connection where he could actually talk. So, uh, so enjoy the sound, sorry. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Ash. Yeah, I, I can hear the sea lions back there. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, so yeah, uh, and then at some point, I you know, I, so I read some Martin Seligman. I I read a lot of other books that uh, referenced this idea of flow and this book by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Um, and at some point, I, I read the book uh, Abundance by Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kotler, and that led me to another book by Stephen Kotler called The Rise of Superman, which was about. Uh, he studied flow uh, in extreme athletes. And um, so that was kind of the first really direct exposure to this idea of flow. Um, and it was interesting because, you know, he was talking about it in terms of, you know, these physical activities and extreme sports. Uh, and my personal experience of flow was much more cognitive, uh, cerebral. So I, I uh, called the type of flow that I was getting into mostly conceptual or creative flow or making connections. Um, but uh, now I'm traveling around the world working on a book on evolutionary theory, which is why I'm in Galapagos. But also, uh, while I've been here last week, I went on a cruise around the islands. And um, one of the things that I've been able to experience here is just this amazing abundance of flow experiences, it's just like almost a constant nonstop uh, way where, because, you know, some of the things I hope you all had a chance to, most of you had a chance to watch the TED talk or start perusing the book, but you know, the, the kinds of uh, hallmarks of flow states that he talks about, you know, focused awareness, being completely involved in what you're doing, a sense of ecstasy, inner clarity, uh, knowing the activity is doable, a sense of serenity, uh, intrinsic motivation. Like these are all things that are very much part of uh, this experience of, travel that I'm having here in Galapagos, which I think is a big reason that Joy wanted to start this series as well, because uh, we're very interested in this connection between travel and flow and continuous learning. Uh, so that's kind of my life right now. And uh, I'm really looking forward to delving more into these topics. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to hear more about kind of where everybody else is uh, in learning about flow and what your experiences are with flow, because like I said, there's lots of different types of flow and lots of paths into it because it is something that can underlie uh, any activity that we do uh, you know whether it's travel or reading or sex or you know like if you look at the table of contents in the book there's just a, a massive range of human experience that he covers so uh, but like I said I've read a lot of books around this topic but I've never actually read this book before so I'm really excited to explore it deeply with you all and uh, looking forward to hearing, hearing your all, all of your experiences and thoughts about it. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ash. Um, wonderful. Uh, so folks, now I'm going to invite all of you folks uh, who are familiar with this concept to share why you're interested in the concepts. Go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to share. Uh, next up is going to be Mike. Mike, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Rakan. Yeah, I when I saw this um, posted, I was immediately drawn to it. Um, I know I've met some of you um, only about a month now, so I'm a professional chess coach, more of a trainer than a coach, and I don't um, necessarily train very high-rated players. I work with kids mostly, or really talented kids, and that that was uh, a great laboratory for me to work on flow and how it relates to kids, because kids in general, very young people, for example, uh, if, they're, if they go to a country and they're learning a language for the first time, in about six months, they're conversant. They're not fluent in the language, but they can actually get around. And one of the reasons for that is there is flow. There aren't the barriers that kind of prevent 
the learning. They're not afraid to make mistakes. Their ears and brain, they're wired for information when they're young. And it turns out as somebody who is watching really, really strong chess players and getting to know them personally, and I'm talking about very, very high rated players, um, I began to ask them questions. I did a lot of interviews about what are they feeling over the board? And at first, a lot of the players could not put into words uh, what they were experiencing. They actually became one with the pieces. So a chess piece, for example, is not very heavy. It doesn't take a lot of strength to pick up a piece. Yet if you watch a professional chess player who's really deep in thought pick up the piece, it's almost like they're picking up something magical. There is flow. It's a literal flow. The hand comes up and the piece lands on the right square. The pieces are in harmony. Everything is working correctly. And the opposite is when their position is bad, for example. And if you look at their bodies physically, the opposite of flow is when you're inhibited. For example, if you look at a professional chess player who's losing, they haven't lost yet, but they're losing, their body does this. I don't know if the screen will do it. You can see that my shoulders are shrinking and my body is getting pushed in. It is the opposite of flow. If a player has a winning position and they're attacking, for example, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm almost up on my haunches, uh, like I'm a cat ready to pounce, which is the flow of attack. Now back to the kids, the biggest problem we had with children and flow was when they start to realize that they can become self-conscious. Because if you look at a kid playing in the street, that is pure flow, pure flow. The games that they invent, the only way they create them is because there's nothing in the way. They're out on the street, they're with their friends and they're performing, they're in flow. The second they become self-conscious around the ages of 12 or 13 is when we experience that a lot. Then all of a sudden, a gap develops. They have a theoretical knowledge of chess. Let's say it could be of music. You may have your own children who are learning to play the piano, for example, and you know that they have a very high level of expertise and you watch them in flow in your house. Yet sometimes if they have to perform in public, what happens if they become self-conscious, it inhibits them and they're not in flow. The music sounds different, their body looks different. So over the years, just coaching, I was a musician when I was a kid, it is an absolute fascinating topic. And um, even as adults, I'm a firm believer that, that you, can, you can work on it and you can get those things that inhibit you out of the way to experience it in almost any endeavor. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, next up, and I, you know, kids are a very simple way to look at flow because you like you kid you look at a young kid and they naturally have it. They naturally have it. Um, next up is Joe. Folks, uh, if you would like to share about your experience with flow, your knowledge of flow, what impressed you about this topic, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Joe. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm extremely interested. I mean, I am not well versed in the topic itself, uh, but I have read quite a bit about some of the studies that have been going on at uh, various universities. Interestingly enough, uh, dealing with athletics uh, specifically, how do athletes get into a state of flow? Um, and specifically, they're able to quantify, quantify a lot of... Uh, uh, things that are not necessarily normally counted. And because it's a controlled system, you can kind of see when players are in sync with one another and actually they start to figure out people that are that you didn't think were contributing, were contributing and creating an environment where a team was working as a team as a whole versus working, you know, just as individuals that where they're parsing statistics together and saying, I need this many points, I need this many uh, people that rebound, I need this, you know, instead of parsing together, they were actually looking how these individuals interacted with one another. Uh, so, and in a controlled environment, you can kind of run those tests a little bit more because there are rules that are the same. 
you, you know, everybody has the same goal in mind so that some of these things are able to be a little looked analyzed much more closely than they, you can't really analyze flow uh, on, a, on a team level in, in uncontrolled environments because everybody has different goals and there's, there's other, uh, there's other uh, factors that come into that. So they've been doing some really interesting stuff at the University of Penn, uh, just seeing how people work together. The other part about it is how it, it answers anxiety as well. Uh, you know, if you can kind of clear out the clutter, it really has a way of being able to allow you to function much more efficiently in your everyday work. And that to me is the most, uh, is the seemingly the most uh, uh, beneficial to me personally is something that I would like to learn a little, little bit more about. I also am very interested in how they measure happiness and the state of flow as well. Uh, because these are statistics that are often used in uh, economy, like there are new uh, economic measures that are based on happiness. And, and so this kind of relay, like kind of relates directly to that. You know, how does one determine happiness? It's not necessarily due to monetary uh, concerns. In fact, it, he speaks about how you have a diminishing returns after a certain amount uh, of income. So how do you make that determination? How are you actually able to quantify that and look at that much more closely is, uh, is I think is very interesting. And it's something that I've always kind of questioned is that, you know, how do you get to that? You know, what's a better measure than just say, and, and then financial, uh, using financial means to measure a, a degree of, of a country's prosperity. So I think that that's, um, those are three areas that I'm specifically interested in. Uh, you know, I, I, so I hope to learn a lot more out of this book that allows me to translate it to those three specific areas. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, folks, if you would like to share what you are getting at what you're hoping to get from the concept of flow, what have you learned so far, go ahead and type uh, exclamation mark. Next up is Robin. Hey, I thought the most important idea, which I got from the book, but um, it was also briefly in the video, was the idea that flow is sort of a balance between boredom and anxiety. Because those, those sort of are the problems that I think most people have with work. Either you're bored or you're anxious. And I thought of it as like, okay, flow is the balance between that. And I even sort of thought, well, if I want to motivate myself more, I can just say whenever I'm bored, I'm preparing myself for when I'm anxious because it might seem boring at the moment that I'm doing it, but really I'm preventing myself from being anxious later on. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, next up is going to be Maritza. Maritza, go ahead. Hello all. So I will be um, going down this journey with the rest of you. I'm fairly new to this specific um, defined concept of flow um, with uh, Mihai Shiksent Mihail. And um, so I will be reading this book for the first time with the rest of you here. And so I, what I believe, you know, the, so the premise I think of the book is, you know, he's, um, he's telling us that, and I, I, it's interesting that Joe brought up the concept of happiness because something that I really like about this concept of flow is that it's similar to the stoic um, tenant that happiness is a byproduct. If we are striving towards happiness, it's the best way to miss the mark, right? Instead, strive for you know, other things that are virtuous and you may find yourself with the by trap product of happiness. And I love that concept because we see that so often in our day to day. We see people who are, if I can just make enough money to buy that shiny car, and then they have the shiny car and they're sitting in the shiny car and they're like, but you know, I need the fancy jacket to go with the shiny car. And these are basic examples, but just, just the attainment of the one superficial goal only spurs within us the unsatisfied 
desire for yet another superficial goal. And so what um, Mihai is saying to us is that he believes that any one person can make themselves either happy or miserable, regardless of what's happening in life. And he says, it's just a matter of changing the contents of your consciousness. And so we'll go through together and we'll, we're gonna learn what it is he's trying to say to us there, right? As we go reading, reading the book and such. And so the, the interesting thing to me is this concept that we already in some cases find ourselves naturally falling into this state, this state that he's calling flow. So it, if we accept that it's a naturally occurring phenomena, well, then we're being invited to take it further. And it's like, well, if we're looking at the flow state as a balance and what, and as if you guys got a chance to watch the video, um, what is explained to us is that we're looking for a balance between challenge and skill. And I actually read in a different thing that, you know, it's a very low sweet pot, some spot, somewhere between four to 5% is the range you're looking for of difficulty. And so we're, we're seeking balance. And that really resonates with me because honestly, I really think that for those of us who've walked down several different journeys here, which we can't, in most paths, what, you know, that shiny gold pot that we're seeking is balance. And so here we go. Again, we're seeking balance and we're, we're looking for how do we find a sweet spot? And so what's most enticing to me is this idea that the assertion that this state, which occurs naturally, is a state that we can seek to encourage to happen more regularly, more often, and to our express benefit and the benefit of others because, you know, it, it spreads outward. And I know someone mentioned about group flow. I'm sorry, I don't remember who, but an interesting thing. I'm curious to hear so many others' thoughts on this concept of group flow. I have not yet formed a, an opinion on, on whether or not I believe in group flow, but I will say that there is something to be said for the environment in a room changing one's state. One's internal state can be affected. I recently participated in an event that is technically, it could be a Christian event, in uh, Puerto Rico, so we have um, El Festival de San Juan. It is a um, festival where everyone goes to the beach the, the night of the 23rd and they're partying it up. And then at the stroke of midnight, everybody starts walking backwards into the ocean and they throw themselves backwards into the river between seven to 12 times. And the, the, re the religious concept is kind of like the re-baptized. It's like uh, St. John the Baptist, but the Puerto Rican cultural aspect of it is you're doing this for good luck and to release negativity. Now, I'm gonna tell you, I was way more sober than just about anyone else there. So I wasn't feeling quite as happy. When we dipped our toes in earlier, we're like, oh, that water's cold. When the countdown started 10 seconds before midnight, everybody get up, you know, you're stripping off your clothes even though you're shivering and you're going, you start walking backwards towards the water. It, it is pitch black because they didn't put any lights on in the, in the ocean. So you can't really see the people around you. But the feeling, just that massive feeling of, and it's this is thousands and thousands of people and all across all of the island of Puerto Rico, every beach is full of people walking backwards at the same exact time and throwing themselves backwards into the water. And I'm telling you, there's a feeling. And you come out of that water feeling a sense of contentment and happiness that you just, it defies explanation. So I don't know if that's flow state. I don't know if I know enough yet to have a word. Maybe by the time we're done with our um, journey here that we're all embarking on together, Maybe I'll feel more comfortable saying, yes, certainly that was flow state. But if it, 
was, then perhaps it was group flow. So that's a question I'm putting out there for everyone. Um, and like I said, I, I am not an authority here, but um, I'm learning just as the rest of you are. And um, I'm, I'm excited to go down the, the aspects of both from a psychological and a neural, um, neuroscience aspect are equally fascinating because, you know, there's, there are studies that talk about opioid release and serotonin levels. And there's this very hard science that can back up this concept. So it's, it's just fascinating. And there, I, I can see parallels and, and there are moments when one looks in past in one's life where you go, okay, that's what's being described there, right? And so it's, I think that this is gonna be extremely exciting um, learning experience for all of us. So welcome to you all. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Maritza. Next up is going to be Ray, Alvaro, uh, Jade, and Judith. Ray. Thank you, Shrikant. Uh, I was actually looking to take the summer off from philosophy meetups, but you have such intriguing uh, topics and discussions, I, I couldn't resist. Why would you, why, how, how can you take a summer off from philosophy? I don't know that. You have you have proved that to me, my friend, that, that I cannot. So I'm in full agreement. And uh, again, a wonderful uh, topic of discussion. I, I find that why it's so appealing and intriguing for myself is I've always uh, felt a sense of flow in certain environments. And I thought it was so wonderful how Ash started off the call and being in the Galapagos in Ecuador and uh, stating that he was in the state of flow. I've noticed that when I've traveled too, especially in really remote and exotic places, which are so far removed from where I, I am and just how everything just seems to naturally flow. The other th uh, pieces that, uh, again, intrigue me about tonight's discussion is um, composers and musicians that uh, this author talks about. And uh, I'm not a professional musician, I'm an amateur musician, but the musicians I study, some of them say they've never written or composed a word. It just kind of flowed through them. They were very, very present. And, and this, you know, this masterpiece kind of came through. And uh, I, I'm not here to recite the YouTube uh, clip, but there was a small blurb with Einstein, even when he was struggling with the theory of relativity, when he kind of backed off and kind of stepped back. And then there was this flow that, uh, that came over, over him at that, uh, in that period. And then I just love the examples of the figure, state, figure skaters. That was actually my favorite, being a Canadian. Uh, skating is very popular up in the north. But uh, just in terms of really being engagement and like the gentleman talked about, uh, my, Michael, with uh, coaching chess players, it's like they could hear the, the, the music, but they were like so engaged in the music at the same time. There was just this great flow. So this is what is taking me away from my summer vacation tree kank is this just really intriguing fascination of experiencing flow and then to have it documented and, and having this great discussion uh, about it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. And we are delighted to have you here. And it's a, uh, you know, this is a great way of spending summer. Uh, next up is going to be Alvaro Jade Judith and Joya. Alvaro. Yes, I, I first came across flow because I, I am conducting some studies that I consider to be a kind of difficult and dull at some times, but I, I do find, full, find fulfillment in conducting those studies. But they, besides being difficult, I, I am studying with people that are uh, very competitive and I was trying to, uh, I was not trying to become a high performer. Uh, I was just trying to be able to concentrate and do uh, my work in, with, with a high level of concentration. And that's when I, I came across other books that indeed 
incorporate flow with high performance and it is, it is mainly in sports more than academia. So when I began reading those books, it was sort of inspirational, but I was like, okay, how do I translate this from sports to academia? I am not an athlete. I am trying to do some math and science and it is not the same. So I did come across the books from flow. I felt it was an answer because a lot of times I would not be focused on my, on my work because I thought there were events in my life that would not allow me to concentrate. Uh, so when I began reading Flow, it really suited my soul in the sense that I thought it was basically telling me, you know, you can be happy by focusing on your work. Uh, but at the same time, it became like Catch-22 because sometimes the, the, talks can be, the talks can indeed be very intense and you're thinking, okay, how do I go about this? Do I concentrate in order to be happy or do I have to be happy first in order to concentrate in my work? And that's when, when, like eventually I have gone through from book to book and I began diving in psychology and, uh, and stoicism and Buddhism and then coming to these meetings. And I began seeing how everything relates and everything has helped me a lot. But very recently I came across the field of positive psychology. So I was introduced to flow, no, not from the perspective of this is positive psychology. Then I came across what is possibly positive psychology and just to relate it to what Joseph is doing when I did for, firstly read flow, the concept of happiness was measured in pretty much economic terms. And I think part of it is because you can make an argument for certain countries people in those countries, maybe kids, maybe having more difficulty concentrating in school work because of the quality of life in those countries. But the interesting thing about when I came across positive psychology is that positive psychology was not defining happiness anymore in economic terms. It was not even defining happiness anymore in the terms that most people define it in a day-to-day -day basis, which may be like going to Cancun and having uh, you know, a lot of work. Alvaro, could you wrap it up in about a minute or so? Yeah, uh, so basically a uh, flow is part of the definition of happiness in positive psychology. And, uh, and yeah, I look forward to exploring that more with you. Wonderful, thank, thank you very much, uh, Alvaro. Uh, next up is Jade followed by Judith and Joya. J, 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 Jade. Um, I'm multitasking, so hopefully I'll make sense. But um, I think Jade, could you speak? I, I, uh, Jade, could you speak into the mic? One. Is that better? A little better. Go ahead. Um. So I always find it interesting how much um human beings decide to study. Um, I feel like we study everything, and on some level, I feel like it's very interesting how um, we're trying to control something that is amazing because it's not a controlled state. It's a state that kind of flows, um, but yet we're trying to control the flow. We're trying to make it happen. If anybody's ever watched Avatar The Last Earthbender, it's kind of like them trying to force him into the av Avatar state wasn't a good idea. Eventually he learned how to control it on his own, but it was something that had to develop naturally. It wasn't necessarily something that, you know, was intended to manipulate. It ended up being going badly. But um, I think um, the thing that I found about flow um, that is interesting is that it's, it's, I think it works because it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about anybody. It's about having the focus on what's being done. It's about focusing on the task at hand. It's not, it, it's, it's something that's larger than you. It's larger than whatever it is that you're doing. And I, and I see that we're talking about it as a psychological phenomenon, but I personally suspect it's more of a spiritual, sensual phenomenon. You're sensing what's happening around you, you're sensing what you're doing, you're sensing the others around you, you're sensing whatever medium you're working with. You're, you're, um, it's, it's visceral. It's not really something that we really can describe accurately. Like, I think it's one of those things where we can kind of give a feel. 
um, of what it is. Like you can explain a sense of it, but you, you don't get it until you have, have had it. Um, and then I think the other thing is, um, it's also interesting because I feel like we're also studying something that's been established in like common sense ways, but we're just trying to get to a deeper level with it because I feel like it would have been the sweet spot. It would have been called like for an athlete, he's in the zone. Um, there are probably a million different, oh, hyperfocus. That's a huge word right now for in the autistic and ADHD, ADHD community. Like they hyperfocus and, and it's considered a bad thing. So it's like, again, how we pathologize things in one respect, but then we consider them like phenomenon, which are good things in other respects. It's just the way we kind of categorize and figure out and try to control. It's just all, it's all fascinating. That's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jade. Uh, next up is going to be Judith, Kevin, and Joya. Judith. A whole bunch of thoughts came up because everybody said things that made different thoughts come up. So I'm just going to go through like bullets, but like what Jay just said, that's so funny. She brought, I so glad actually she brought up hyper-focus because uh, much earlier I was thinking um, when I was trying to imagine, okay, so what kinds of things would be flow state? I was thinking, is it flow state, you know, when kids have those repetitive, you know, habits is it would that be a, a form of flow i don't know for them you know like what does that do soothe them somehow um but anyway um i have limited knowledge of some flow state or experience with it i think i i um it is a wonderful feeling um when you are in it it is visceral um i you know i'm not skilled in any particular thing but like if i'm drawing i can get you know just so absorbed in it so i like the graph that was in the video because it kind of indicated that you know when you are at that sweet spot of your challenging your abilities um your focus that's when you are likely so it doesn't have to be like you are an expert um um, so like, um, skiing, you know, if, to me, it's almost a very physical. I remember as a kid skiing, you know, you just like your, your body just knows what to do, even though I wasn't a great skier either. I'm not really good at anything. Um, but again, like a uh, group, group flow, when you were talking about that. So if you've ever thrown a ball with somebody and you throw the ball and they miss and you miss and they miss, and then suddenly you start to get into a, a state of flow where, you're catching and you know you're throwing and catching back and forth back and forth and it's kind of nice or ping pong you know not something i'm good at either but <laughs> and not um playing for a win you know not like tennis or playing for a win but just getting the ball back and forth you can kind of reach a flow state which really feels good your your body knows where to go what to do and you're not like having to think it's just going and i don't know i think that's similar to a flow state. Oh, and then Ray brought up musicians. And I've heard that so many times as well. Musicians saying that I didn't write this. I don't know where it came from. It came through me. I've heard so many musicians say that. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you, Judith. Uh, next up is Kevin, Jyoti, and Joya. Kevin. Thank you, sir. Can, um... uh, can you go ahead and speak into the mic, please, Kevin? Yes, better. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, this reminds me of the first is uh, Dao Jin chapter eight, be like water. The highest goodness is the same like water. Also, like one guy is called Alan Watts. We heard, we hear his uh, YouTube. Number 10, he's always go with the flow like water. And uh, our best, our friend, you know, uh, 52 living idea, one guy, Richard poem, poem, you, I can't remember, recall his name. He always make call me like, uh, let's uh, let, let your life flow like water. You know, he, he used that. And for me, yeah, from life, from the physical house, uh, like the book talking about everything about flow. It's, it's, it's a self-actualization. It's a, rather than a self, it's transcendent, it's over past, uh, make more money, more and more, then it, uh, buy houses, <laughs> more and more, uh, build a career uh, on the top, it's a never end. So it's later life flow. 
Thank you. Thank you. With one exception of a K, we are back to Jay's again. So it's going to be Jyoti, Jeff, and Joya. Jyoti. Yeah, hi all. Uh, I'm usually reluctant to talk about these topics because, um, you know, the psychology of philosophers make it very complicated. But if you are, in, if you do meditation, then you know that you are in a state of flow because your whole mind, your whole body becomes calm and very tuned to your sensations. And to me, that is a flow. It enhances your focus. It gives you some motivation to uh, interact with your environment at your will. And um, it motivates you. So um, I think you, you can achieve that state. And in India, we have something called satsang, which in which the group of people, at, uh, where I went, it was a group of women, who used to sit together and chant or sing all the religious songs. And there used to be a pin drop silence while they were reciting these chants. Um, everybody was very, they were all together. There were 20 people, 20 women in the group, but they were, you would think there was one person. They all got unified. The whole souls were unified. And that's where you could just feel uh, if a stranger walked in there, he or she would see there was a harmony in, the, in everybody's soul. And that to me is a very pious and very pure kind of a sensation, which you can't achieve by like Jade said, by pushing yourself into some, uh, through some external means. It has to come from within. And to me, that is that is a real flow. And you know, for children who have ADHD, if you teach them how to focus through themselves through meditation and what have you, instead of putting them on Ritalin and um, other medications, you will see how they will turn around. And that happen that can happen to anybody at any stage of uh, any stage of life and any stage of mind. You could start doing it at an older age, you could start doing it at middle age, and you will find the, the you know, uh, you will find the fruits r r right away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jyoti. Appreciate okay. that. Uh, next up is going to be Jeff, followed by Joya. So um, I'll, I'll share my experience with this actually growing up. Um, my, my father was, was kind of a student of this. He, he didn't call it flow, um, but um, he did uh, teach us how to ski. And when he taught us, there were three things that he was very clear that he was emphasizing. He told us to relax, to focus, and, and, and to believe we could do it, which later I would come to call confidence. Because um, if, you, if you got, you know, if you got tense about it, you couldn't really do it. And if you did, if you weren't really focused, if you weren't really watching, stuff could happen that could throw you. And and, um, and then you had to believe, you know, that you really could do it because sometimes it was really hard. And uh, and and so he started off by teaching this to us um, as individuals because we were skiing, and we actually started ski racing, um, and and we did very well. But it was all about relax, focus, and 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 be and, and confidence, believing you could do it. And then when I got just a little bit older, um, I was playing baseball, and I learned how to throw as a pitcher. I learned how to throw a curve, meaning that I could start a pitch, going right at somebody, and then I could make the ball curve over the plate. And we were just twelve, you know. And anybody at 12 who has a ball coming right at their head is going to get out of the way. And I really enjoyed being able to do this because I was really good at it. And, and I, I'd, I'd throw, I'd, I'd curve everything. I'd curve beach balls, baseballs, wiffle balls, everything. I just got infatuated with it. And the interesting thing was um, what the coach told me to do, and actually I think my dad spoke to him about it, was all I was doing, and Judith, as you said it, 
All I was doing was playing catch with the catcher. That's all I was doing. It didn't matter what the situation was. It didn't matter who the batter was. Nothing matters. I was just going to throw curveballs that were going to start out in one place and were going to curve right into the catcher's glove. And that was it. And I knew I could do it and I would just focus on it. And I made the all-star team. It was, you know, it was ridiculous, but all I was doing was playing catch. And, um, and I loved doing it, but my dad made movies for a living. He was a, he was a documentary um, producer, director. And um, when it came time that what I was going to do, it looked like I was going to be the quarterback of a football team. He took me on set with him at the beginning of a movie. And he would bring everybody together for um, a couple of days, not making the movie, just to really get to know each other, just to really build their relationships. And, and, and what I later began to understand was um, their trust and belief in each other and uh, in, in their own competencies and what they could do. And then he'd do the movie. And so he took me uh, into that and then he showed, and then I got to see him direct, um, you know, for several days with the movie. And, and he told me that that was what it was like to be the quarterback of a football team. That you had to be, have kind of a relationship with everybody where you were helping them to work better with each other together, but you had to see the whole thing in the whole. And it actually happened very, very fast. And it did, it happened super fast. There's so many things that a quarterback has to pay attention to in the 15 seconds of a play, you can't even watch it. You, it's like juggling. You can't see it. You can't see your folks. You can't see the other folks. You know you know what the play is, but then maybe it doesn't go that way. And the, again, you had to be relaxed. You had to be really focused and you had to be confident and believe you could do it. And so then years later, I had the opportunity when I was running a very complex leadership program to be able to bring my dad to it and show him what I had learned from watching him produce and direct this documentary movie. And, uh, and he debriefed it with me. <laughs> and, and, and that was basically it. It was, it, it, it was flow. It was, you couldn't really think, you were just immersed in something. But the qualities that you were after, uh, in, in, in the way he would explain it, where you, you were relaxed, you were focused, and you were confident. Wonderful, that, that was amazing, Jeff. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, next up is Joya. Thank you, everyone. I've really been enjoying hearing everyone's story. I feel this is so amazing to me. Uh, I know we're supposed to be sharing why we're interested in this topic. So I'll share, I got into this I was really touched by the story of how Mihai Csikszentmihalyi embarked on this quest to understand flow. If you watched the video, you would have heard he was a child. He was born in Hungary. He was a child during World War II. And he saw the devastation that that had on his family, on his community, on everyone around him. And so he was deeply interested to understand why was it that some people were able to maintain a happy state and get through this awful tragic experience while others were completely destroyed emotionally and, and spiritually by what had happened. And although thankfully I never went through anything so tragic in my childhood, I feel all of us as human beings, th this is what happens. We look around and we see so much suffering in the world. And as a kid, I had that exact same experience to look around and see adults who were bitter, upset, frustrated, disappointed, and others who were able to maintain happiness and joy in life. And I had the same burning question always of, of what is it that allows people to achieve this state of happiness and deep fulfillment? And when I finally read this book for the first time, it was in the mid 2000s when someone introduced this book to me and I had the experience of, oh my God, like I can't believe somebody else went out and did all of this research. And you can tell his story, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, that he went around and talked to people literally all around the globe to put together the, the experiences and draw out from the similarities of all these experiences, this 
what he eventually defined as flow. It felt to me like a book that had just been written for me and this big question that I had kept asking. And what I even love about this question is that there is still so much more, I believe, to discover of what is it that leads to a full, flourishing, happy life. But there is so much, I believe, that we can learn from flow. And I love something that I think has been a theme that's come up here that people have been pointing out. I think it was Jyoti said that uh, you know, philosophers and psychologists can sometimes get very technical about this, but really this is such a human experience. And I think this was something even Csikszentmihalyi himself understood. Uh, my understanding is he even used the word flow because that was the term that came up again and again as he was talking with people and they were describing what it was like to be in this state, that the word flow was just the word that kept coming up again and again. And as everyone has been pointing out, there are so many of these activities where we all had this experience of flow, even if we never had the technical term or way to think about it. Uh, like people have mentioned that it's being in the zone or runner's high or uh, comedians, I think, talk about being in the pocket. So I think this is such a human experience. But for me, it's been so valuable to then actually also look at it through the lens of a psychologist and through the lens of a researcher. For me personally, I'll share that after I read this book and then it led me on a deep dive all about flow. So those of you who know my background know that um, I started my career in academia. I was in the literature department, but what I even loved about literature was that it provided a way to have such a deep dive into human experience and you could do interdisciplinary work with history and psychology and philosophy. That's exactly what I loved about it. And eventually I decided not to pursue a career in academia, but I've always been really interested in continuous learning. I do believe that learning and growth is one of the things that's so fundamental to how we achieve flourishing and happiness in life. And when I left academia, which is 10 years ago now, I could see even then that the internet was going to change possibilities for how we learn and grow. And 52 Living Ideas is just a wonderful example of how we're leveraging this new technology and making all of that possible. And one insight I had recently was to see that there is this amazing potential with all the technology we have available. And I also do believe we need the boots on the ground, in person, in community, with flesh and blood, other people. So I've gotten really interested in thinking about combining travel with continuous learning and Ash and I, months ago, were starting to have lots of conversations about thinking about travel and continuous learning and human flourishing. And he and I just kept coming back to this topic of flow. And as I remember it, at one point, he even just said to me, like, maybe flow is something we really just need to focus on and make this part of this niche that we're exploring. And he might have mentioned that he and I, now we've each really gone in depth to learn more about flow. We've each been training with the Flow Research Collective, which is led by Stephen Kotler. And that's led us to really interesting explorations on the cutting edge of flow. Maritza was talking about all the developments in neuroscience and all of this really complex biology that underlies flow. But I'm so excited that we are starting out here with the original seminal Mihai Chick Sent Me High flow book. I recently reread it and it was so amazing to me how this book is now over 30 years old and there's still, I believe, so much that we can mine from this book that even in the Flow Research Collective, there we have a really great focus on peak performance and the peak performance aspects of being in the flow state. But there's so much more here this book is the psychology of optimal experience. So even just thinking about how optimal experience combines with peak performance, and I can't wait to go through this book with all of you. So a couple of things I did want to mention, um, I think Joe and Alvaro were even talking about this idea of how we can leverage flow for productivity. And Ash was mentioning how Stephen Kotler, his first book, Rise of Superman, 
talked about flow in the context of the athletes and the extreme athletic sports, but he actually had a recent book that's come out. So I even wanted to mention if, if people are interested in the most recent uh, work on this for a general audience that takes these ideas of flow even beyond just extreme sports. Stephen Kotler has a book called The Art of the Impossible, which if anyone is interested in that particular topic, you might want to explore. And then a lot of people have been talking about the idea of group flow. And so one of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's most prolific graduate students is a scholar named Keith Sawyer. And he has a book called group genius. And I looked up the subtitle, it is the creative power of collaboration. So I think if anybody's really interested in the, the topic of group flow, I would recommend that book by Keith Sawyer, Group Genius. And lastly, I just wanted to share, since I've gone more in depth in thinking about flow, it's made me become actively aware of what are the experiences in my life where I can reliably get into flow. And I really want to thank Srikant because definitely the community and the atmosphere that he's created here with 52 Living Ideas, this is definitely one of my big sources of group flow. So I just think it's so perfect that we're here and we can get into group flow together and explore flow. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Joya. All right. So now we're going to go into breakout rooms um, and the breakout rooms are going to be moderated. Uh, so people with the star in their names are going to be the facilitators. The whole purpose, uh, you know, we got the following rules in the breakout rooms. Keep on topic, be brief, be courteous, encourage others to speak. Okay. Um, and that's what the facilitators are going to do. The breakout rooms will last only for 20 minutes. And what we're going to talk about the concept of flow, how we are planning to read the book, what we are expecting to get out of it. And the most important thing is that when we come back from the breakout rooms, come back with the best question, the biggest question you have on your mind. We will collect all the questions and then we are going to do a lightning round of answers uh, to the questions. I mean, I'm delighted to see so many people who are familiar with these ideas um, over here. And I think if we, you know, I'm, I'm hoping and I'm not just hoping, but I'm fully expecting that all of us are going to learn a lot of things that we don't know about because there is just so many people with so many different perspectives, all focused on this one thing called flow. All right. So I'm starting the breakout rooms now. 